Award-winning author and very talented storyteller Steve Reed is here today to help take us back in time for a closer look at the resurrection of Jesus Christ as told by James, Jesus' earthly half-brother. I remember that day as we were entering Jerusalem for the Passover celebrations. I remember the crowd was huge. They were so excited to see Jesus, some of them for the very first time. And as we went on through the week, the crowds just continued to swell. And then I remember Jesus calling all of his disciples, his close followers, to that upper room and watching Jesus as he humbly bowed down and washed the feet of his disciples. And a little while later, he mentioned that somebody would deny him. And Peter boldly stated that he would never deny Jesus. And Jesus just looked at him and said, Simon, before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. And shortly thereafter, Jesus said something about somebody actually betraying him. And all of the disciples looked around at each other and, and questioned, was it me? Was it me? Was it you? And finally, a little while later, Judas Iscariot got up and walked out. Nobody knew why he walked out except Jesus. A short time thereafter, after we were finished with the supper, the supper that Jesus said was his last supper that he would take with us. He gathered us up and he took us out to the Garden of Gethsemane. And as we got into the garden, Jesus told some of his disciples to stay behind and, and pray for strength. And he asked Peter, James, and John to go a little bit farther forward with him. And Jesus went on still a little bit farther. You could hear the anguish in his voice as he was crying. He's crying out to God, Father, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, yours be done. After a couple of hours and, and the disciples dozing off a couple of times, there was a group of people, a crowd that was coming towards the disciples and Jesus. There were temple officials, there were guards, there were Roman soldiers, but they were led by Judas. And they walked right up to Jesus. Judas put his arms on Jesus' shoulders and kissed him on the cheek and said, this is the one you're looking for. With that, the guards grabbed Jesus and started to take him away. But some of the guards started chasing the disciples. They didn't want to catch him. All they wanted to do was to scare the, the disciples off so that they didn't cause trouble. For the next couple of hours, I'm just simply wandering around. I have no clue what's going on. I can't figure out anything. Why in the world would they arrest my brother? Well, they arrested him because he was good, because he was honest, because he told the truth, because he gave, made miracles. After a couple of hours, I realized mother needs to know exactly what's going on. I, I found some of her friends, and they told me that she was staying out with Mary and Martha just a, a short distance away in Bethany. So I went out there quickly. Lazarus came to the door when I knocked. And I saw Mother sitting there. She had a huge smile on her face. And I told her, Mother, Jesus has been arrested. Her demeanor changed completely. She started to sob. She says, I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. I said, Mother, what are you talking about? I knew he was going to have this happen. Well, it was late in the day. We were tired. I tried to get some sleep, but I tossed and turned. The next morning I got up and I was trying to be as quiet as I possibly could. As I'm heading out the door, Mother saw me and she says, where are you going? I said, well, Mother, I'm going back into Jerusalem to see if there's anything I can do for Jesus. She says, I'm coming with you. I said, Mother, it is not safe. You need to stay behind. She says, don't argue with me. I'm coming with you. So off we go. As we got closer and closer to the inner courts, we ran into John and he escorted us through those gates and we see Jesus standing right in front of, of Pontius Pilate. And he's, he's standing there, he's saying, I don't want to have anything to do with this. And he, he takes this bowl of water and washes his hands as if it was a ceremony that he's cleansing himself. He says, I'll have him scourged, but I, want, I don't want to have anything else to do with this. A couple of soldiers grabbed Jesus and dragged him down the steps, and they tied him to a whipping post. 
And then another soldier came along with this whip. And, and on the ends of the, the strands of the whip, it had sewn in little pieces of metal. So every time that soldier came back and came down with that whip on Jesus' back, it ripped off flesh from his back, his sides, his arms, his legs. I started crying out, stop it, you're going to kill him. And about that time, another soldier came along, and he had a huge shield in his arms. And he hauled off and hit me in the side, and I fell to the ground. I had no clue what was happening there. Mother and, and John helped me up. And that soldier just looked at me and scolded me in a, in a snarly voice and said, Shut up or you're next! I didn't know what to do. Thirty-nine lashes. And my brother survived it. Most men would have killed them. They untied him. He fell to the ground. And about that time, two other soldiers came and, and they had these huge cross beams and they just threw it down at, a, at his side. And they told him to pick it up and carry it. Well, he tried standing, he'd barely stand. He'd walk a couple of feet and collapse again. And this went on for a short amount of time. And, and one of the soldiers saw this man in the crowd. He was just a traveler. His name was Simon. And they grabbed him and they told him to pick up that crossbeam. So he and Jesus carried that crossbeam through town. And they get to the dump, the place of the skull. They said it was Golgotha. And when they got there, there was a, an upright beam that was laying on the ground, and they took that cross beam, and they laid it across it and tied it together. And then they threw Jesus on his back on top of that cross. They tied his, his wrists and his feet to the cross. And then another soldier came along with a huge mallet and spikes and started driving those spikes in his hands. Stop it. He doesn't need more. They lifted up that, that cross and they dropped it in the hole in the ground. And with the sheer movement of it falling into the ground, it ripped the flesh from his hands and his feet. My brother, my innocent, perfect brother, why are they doing this? An hour goes by. It starts to get dark. Jesus whispers, I'm thirsty. This guy comes over with this long stick, and, and he's got a rag tied on the end that's soaked in vinegar. And he tries to get Jesus to drink some of that vinegar. He just spit it out. I shoot him off. And a few minutes later, he looks down at Mother and and John, he says, John, behold your mother. Mother, behold your son. Obviously, Jesus had something else that he had planned for me, but he wanted John to take care of our mother. A little while later, he cries out with every ounce of breath and energy, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? At that moment, God had abandoned my brother. A little while later, it's getting darker by the minute. Jesus can barely breathe. He looks up at the heavens and he says, Into your hands I commend my spirit. It is finished. And with that, he took his last breath and he died. Why did he die? Shortly thereafter, another soldier came along and he drew his sword and he thrust it in Jesus' side. Then the blood and the water came down. I was incensed. I was furious. I saw some, some Pharisees and Sadducees, some of the temple officials over here, and they're laughing and mocking at my brother and I'm going to kill somebody. I take off running as fast as I can, 
John, thankfully, is faster than I am. He managed to grab my, my shirt just before I got to them. And he pulled me to him. And he says, let's go change. There's nothing else we can do here. As we're leaving, Joseph, dear friend Joseph of Arimathea, he came to us and he says, I've gotten permission to take Jesus' body and bury him in my family tomb. Is that okay with you? Well, we quickly agreed. So we took Jesus down from the cross. We wrapped him in those burial cloths. We laid him on that tomb. I just stood there crying out, God, why? As we start walking away, Mother says, please take me back, back to Bethany. So off we go. We get to Mary and Martha's home and we knock on the door. Mary is standing there. Mother can barely walk in three steps and she collapses on the floor. Mary looks at me and says, what's happened to you? I was covered in blood. My, my rose, my garments were torn, were cut. I guess I got closer to those, those Roman guards and the temple officials closer than what I thought. Well, she gets me cleaned up and I'm sitting there. We're, we're just sitting there looking at each other. What just happened? We had no clue. We didn't know what to say. We felt lost and abandoned. Well, we tried to get some sleep overnight. I tossed and turned all night. I slept for maybe five minutes. The next morning I got up along with everybody else and we're still just sitting there. We're in shock. What has happened? Later in the day, I decided I couldn't stay there anymore. I had to go walking. So I took a, a path outside of town, the opposite direction from Jerusalem. And I'm just asking God, why? Why did all of this happen? You could have saved him. Why did all of this happen? I started pondering and reflecting on all of the things that, that Jesus and I used to do as we were young boys and in our teen years. I remember working in the fields and Jesus would go off for two or three days at a time and he'd, he'd come back and he'd share things that the Father had, had taught him while he was away and alone. And I remember this one time Jesus came back and he was sharing things from, from the prophet Isaiah. And Isaiah said, oh, we like sheep have gone astray. Like a lamb before the slaughter, he stood there silently. By his stripes, you were healed. By his stripes, you were healed. What in the world did Isaiah mean by that? By his stripes, wait. When they scourged him, they left stripes on his back. He stood before Pilate. He didn't say a word like a lamb before the slaughter. He stood there silently. Jesus knew this was going to happen. Isaiah was prophesying exactly what, ha what happened to Jesus. Jesus wasn't just quoting Isaiah. He knew all of this would happen. He told us, destroy this temple, and in three days, he's coming back. He knew that he was the perfect lamb. He knew that he lived a sinless life so that I could be forgiven, so we could all be forgiven. I've got to go tell the others. I ran back to Lazarus' home as quickly as I possibly could. I burst in the door, and I start telling them, I'm like a raving, crazy man telling them what's going on. And they said, James, just relax, just settle down and have something to drink. I didn't know what else to say. They weren't believing me. God had just revealed to me what all of this was about. It's late in the day. I finally fell asleep after a couple of days. I got up early that next morning. And I decided I've got to go back into Jerusalem. I've got to find all of my friends, all of Jesus' disciples. So I take off out the door, and John is right behind me. And we're running towards where we think the disciples have been hiding. 
And along the way, we find some of the women that, that had gone to the tomb. They were going to take care of Jesus' needs and, and tend to his body. And they said, the tomb is empty. There was an angel there that said, why are you looking for the living amongst the dead? We got to where the disciples were hiding. We go in. And the women start sharing the things that, that they had witnessed. I start sharing some of the things that, that God had revealed to me. And all of a sudden, Peter and John take off running to go to that tomb. John gets there first. He's looking inside and Peter runs right past him inside the tomb. He picks up those burial cloths that, that are soaked in blood, in Jesus' blood. They dropped those burial cloths. They turned and they ran back to the disciples. And when they walked in the room, they described exactly what they had seen. Mary needed more. She wasn't sure what they had done with Jesus' body. So Mary takes off and she heads back to the garden. And when she got there, she saw, she saw a gardener standing there and she looks at him and she says, if you know where my master is, would you please tell me I'd like to tend to his body? And she's kneeling down by this gardener. And all of a sudden, that gardener says, Mary. She looks up at him. Jesus, Master, you're alive. You're alive. Jesus, and she gives him a huge hug. He says, go, tell your friends that I'm alive, that I am risen. She takes off running back to where the disciples are hiding. She walks in and she tells them exactly what she has just seen. I just saw the master. He's alive. Jesus is alive. I saw him. I held him. Jesus is alive. Nobody believed her. They were curious what in the world could have possibly happened to Jesus' body, but, but it was so hard to believe. Just a day before, a couple of days before, Jesus was hanging on a cross. Why was he hanging on that cross? For my sins, for our sins. And finally, in the middle of the room, with the doors locked, Jesus, my brother, appears right in the middle of the room. He's standing there in all of his glory. We see his hands with the, with the nail prints. We see his feet, his side. Jesus is alive. He raised others from the dead. He's raised himself from the dead as well. And he tells us once again, I had to suffer for you. I love you so much. I had to suffer for you. I had to take on your sin and be abandoned by God so that you could spend time in eternity with God the Father. All we can say is Jesus is alive. He is risen. Jesus is risen. Hallelujah. Jesus is alive.